There is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, and then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Father, as we gather in this place once again, we pray that that might be each one of our prayers tonight. Lord, that we might meditate upon you and upon your word. Lord, that we might consider how great and awesome you are. And so, Lord, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you tonight, Lord. We pray once again for your Holy Spirit to move among us and to touch our lives, to take away the anxieties and the cares of the world in which we live, so that we might come indeed into a sanctuary, a place of rest, a place of peace. As the Lord be with us now as we commit the evening to you, and as we stand to worship you, may you be glorified in our midst. We ask it in Jesus' name, and we ask it for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Let's stand together. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries. at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God all will see how great how great is our God H2H he stands Time is in his hands, beginning at the end, beginning at the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. stands and age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning at the end beginning at the end the God had three and one Father Spirit Ah! Uh -huh. 
Come live. Come live in me all my life. Take over. Come breathe in me and I will rise on eagles. And Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you, Jesus. I adore.
and Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. And Jesus, I adore you. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master. Something about that name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name, Master.
let's sing the first verse again. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with the Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Jesus. Let's stand together and oh come and sing this song with gladness as your hearts are filled with joy and lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Father, indeed, we pray that with the power of your Holy Spirit that you might come and fill each one of us afresh this evening as we gather around your word one more time. Lord, be with us and may your spirit speak to deeply into our hearts so that Christ may be glorified. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Why don't we turn around, shake someone's hand, and say good evening to them. Okay, tomorrow morning, coffee morning, and uh, then Sunday morning we're back in Galatians after our dedication last week. Uh, we're in Galatians chapter 3, uh, starting at uh, about verse 6, and we're going to look at what it means uh, to be a righteous person, and uh, we we'll look forward to that Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday evening, uh, Ian Scott will be sharing on Acts chapter 27, uh, my favorite word, the penultimate chapter uh, of uh, Acts, and uh, they make their way to Rome. And uh, then we'll finish it the following week. We had advertised we were going to do a Purim night, but uh, I think I'm going to do a series uh, on the Feast of Israel. So I'm going to postpone it uh, so that when we do all the, the different Feasts of Israel week after week, uh, we'll have them all together. So uh, we'll be in Acts a week in Sunday. Uh, but uh, pray uh, about these things that are coming up. Monday night's a men's meeting, and uh, Stuart Scott's going to be sharing 
uh, on Monday evening. But let's turn tonight to perhaps the most famous chapter in the Bible, John chapter 3. I don't know how far we'll get this evening, but uh, it's such a wonderful, wonderful chapter. And uh, the tendency would be just to spend almost the rest of the year uh, in this. But uh, let's read through probably about the first Eleven verses. We'll take, if we go beyond that, so be it. Uh, John 3, verse 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If it were possible, I would like you to try and transport yourself back uh, just about 2,000 years and imagine this situation. This must be one of the most beautiful moments in the New Testament. There are many times when people have what could be called moments with Jesus. One of my favorite Bible teachers and ministers uh, was, of course, George Matheson, the blind uh, minister who ministered down in, in Ellen, right next to Danun, three miles from Danun. And uh, he was there. He was a blind preacher. And uh, he wrote a commentary called Moments with the Master. Uh, and as I was doing some research on the internet, I found uh, some guy had plagiarized his message. And uh, I'm not going to plagiarize his message, just choose that phrase, moments with the master. And this must have been a tremendous experience for this man, Nicodemus. And we're going to look at some characteristics about Nicodemus. But if you can, in your mind's eye, picture the situation. It's nighttime. We know he came by night. Now, where was Jesus? Was he in the Mount of Olives? Could he have been down in the Garden of Gethsemane? Could he have been in the Temple Mount? We don't know where he is, and so it would be wrong to speculate. But I would imagine it would have been a very strange situation. Were his disciples there? They may well have been, because they may have uh, been the ones who have recorded what's been written. As you know, Jesus has about half a dozen disciples by this time. He's in Jerusalem. It's night time. And all of a sudden, through the shadows comes one of the most eminent religious people in Judaism. A ruler of the Jews, a man, we're told, of the Pharisees. And in my mind's eye, I don't know what your mind's eye is like, I see him with his shawl over his head, it's night time. And he, he comes to where Jesus is, and he looks at Jesus and says, can we have a conversation? Now, I would imagine that Jesus, in his human form, knew who Nicodemus was. He was a very powerful man in Judaism and in Jerusalem. But in his human form, he, he may not have known who Nicodemus was. But as God, he definitely knew who Nicodemus was. And I see Jesus sitting there, perhaps around the table, perhaps sitting in the hillside. And Nicodemus comes up to him and says, in essence, can we have a discussion? Can we have a chat about things? And I can see a smile on Jesus' face as this 
leader of the Jews comes to talk to him. And what I want us to consider, perhaps not right now, perhaps at the end of the message when you go home, is if you had the opportunity tonight to sit down with Jesus Christ in a very informal setting and have a chat with him, what would you ask him? Now, I've been kind of wrestling with this because Nicodemus has a conversation with God because that's who Jesus is. We would call that prayer. And so we do have the opportunity to sit down and ask the Lord things and to talk to the Lord. We call it prayer. But in your mind's eye, just imagine for a second that, you know, when you were home this evening, the Lord would sit down in your living room with you, just the two of you, and you could ask him anything you wanted about the intricacies of the universe or about the framework of man or about the situation in the world. What would you ask him? Now, and I know that each one of us would have a different thing. But this is an awesome moment with the Master when Nicodemus takes this time to seek out Jesus, I'm assuming to sit down with Jesus and to have a conversation, a discussion with him. You know, so often our prayer life is just talking to God. We have a list. Lord, I'm in trouble. You know, I need better health, better money, you know, a better job. You know, and we go through all these things and we've got a list. This makes it a little bit different. But as I said, we do have the opportunity to take time to be with the Lord every single day and to develop and cultivate an intimacy where we have a conversation with him. We don't talk to him all the time. I'm sure there are times when, you know, we go on our knees and we pray and we, we, we give them a list of everything that we want and the Lord would just be about to talk to you and all of a sudden you say, Amen. That's not what prayer is about. Back in the 1960s, there was a, a, a country singer who was a bit of a pop star as well. As you know, he died in a plane crash, Jim Reeves. Uh, and he was a Christian. He'd recorded a couple of gospel albums. And this is one of my favorite songs. And it, it kind of came back to me uh, when I was thinking about Nicodemus. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed how long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? How long has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven? How long since you knew that he'd answer you and would keep you the long night through? How long has it been since you walked with the dawn and felt that the day is worth living? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? And so as we think about Nicodemus, Jesus obviously cared for Nicodemus, but he cares for each and every one of us and longs for that intimacy, longs for that opportunity for us just to unburden our life. And, and it may not be unburdening something. It might just be, you know, a conversation, asking for direction, for wisdom, for uh, you know, your, your role, your goal, your purpose in life. But so often we can miss that opportunity. So often we're G'd up by circumstances, miracles, healings, power signs and these things, and it kind of gets us going. If you back up the, to the previous chapter, if you remember after Jesus had cleansed the temple, it says in verse 22, sorry, verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Many believed, yeah, yeah, th this man's special. This man's different. This rabbi, this teacher, this miracle worker, this healer, he's different. But Jesus, and this is a strange verse, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He knew that this group of people were seeing what they could get from Jesus. Well, they believed who he was, but 
Jesus knew that they weren't taking that step to be a disciple. And discipleship is very important. And so we get into chapter 3. We see that Jesus knows the hearts of men. He knows each and every heart in this sanctuary this evening. He knows those who are sincere. He knows those who are insincere. And in the first number of verses in chapter 3, and by the way, th- this is a classic chapter, it really is. Um, I was doing some, I love church history, and I was reading way back to the time of William of Normandy. And uh, when he came over uh, from France, uh, he made a guy called Osmond. Uh, yes, as in you know, Jeremy and Marie and all these people. Osmond, he made him a saint um, because he took um, the Bible and the Gospels and he divided it up into daily readings and particularly Sunday readings that they would read on specific Sundays throughout the year. And of course, it's been adopted by uh, the Catholic Church and also the Anglican Church and the Church of England to have these special readings on special days. The John chapter 3, even to this day, is read on Trinity Sunday because it testifies of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And and that's a a lot of of nuisance for you. Uh, The Bishop of Salisbury, St. Osmond, uh, way back in uh, 1078, uh, worked this out. Anyway, here we have Nicodemus dealing with an inquiring mind. And surely, and I think it was, I can't remember if it was last Sunday, the Sunday before, we talked about, you know, as Christians, we don't check our brains at the door. You know, people out there think, oh, you Christians, you're just brainwashed. You know, you don't think for yourself. You know, you do what somebody tells you. You know, what the denomination tells you to do. No. Jesus loves an inquiring mind, and we should all have inquiring minds. It's not sinful to ask and inquire of the Lord about the things of life, about heaven, about sin, about salvation, about sanctification. Ask the Lord these things. And this man has an inquiring mind. And there's two things that happen. First of all, the Lord reproves presumption. Nicodemus comes and he's got some preconceived ideas about who Jesus is. But what makes him different from those that we see at the end of chapter 2 is he elevates faith. And Nicodemus was a man who was willing to take the step of faith. We pointed out a couple of weeks ago when we were last year, Nicodemus is mentioned three times in John's Gospel. Here, desiring Jesus. In chapter 7, defending Jesus. And in chapter 19, at the crucifixion, after the crucifixion, being devoted to Jesus. He became a disciple. But we shouldn't rush through this section. Jesus reproves presumption, but he elevates faith. And he wants to do that in all of our life. If we were going to give you a, 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 a breakdown of the first 21 verses, really, of this chapter, in the first 10 verses, we would have what's been called the world's greatest tragedy. Now, what do you mean? It doesn't sound like a tragedy to me. The fact that there's a need to be, as Jesus says, born again. And the tragedy is many people don't take that step to have that new birth in their life. And they're lost for eternity. So we see the world's greatest tragedy. But from verse 11 where we finished, we then see the world's greatest truth. And of course, verse 16 is the world's greatest text. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a great verse. Whosoever. Stick your name in there. For God so loved the world that if David Simpson believed in him, David Simpson would have everlasting life. Put your own name in there. It's as simple as that. The gospel. Whosoever believes in him, the world's greatest text, then the world's greatest test was the crucifixion. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. 
And so we'll look at that as we go through it. But what prompted Nicodemus? I want us to try and have this analytical mind, this inquiring mind. What prompted Nicodemus to end up going to visit Jesus by night? Of course, we can't say definitely, but I've got quite a suspicion that it may have had something to do with the fact that Jesus had cleaned the temple out. Remember the temple? They were selling animals at inflated prices. You would bring your goat, your dove, your sheep, your bull, your pigeon. You would bring them to the temple and the priest would look at them and say, oh, there's a blemish in that one. And if you want more information about that, go back and read the book of Malachi when you go home. It's only four chapters. But they would bring that and they would say, no, that animal's not suitable for a sacrifice. But strangely enough, we've got one over here. And of course, it was well above the asking price. And so you would bring out your Greek drachma and say, well, I'll buy one of them and say, oh, we don't take drachma in the temple. It's got to be the temple shekel. And so uh, we'll give you a good rate of exchange. And you say, but I can get a better rate of exchange than the travel agency uh, but, uh, or the equivalent. But there was this inflated price and they were ripping people off. And people still have that idea about Christianity today. They rip people off. So Jesus overthrows the temple, the tables in the temple, and causes quite a commotion. Again, try and picture in your mind's eye. Half a dozen disciples, maybe five disciples with them. They walk into the temple. Jesus starts throwing the tables over. Puts Peter, James, and John, Philip, Nathaniel, thinking, do we join in or do we stay back? You know, should we throw a table over? It must have been very confusing for them. But everybody in Jerusalem would have known what had happened. This carpenter from Nazareth, who had this great zeal for his father's house. The Sanhedrin were the ruling body. And they would have known what had taken place in the temple. Was Nicodemus there at the time? I don't know. But he undoubtedly knew the score. So was he prompted by some kind of wonder? You know, what makes this man so zealous for the temple? Maybe Nicodemus had a conscience and maybe he was well aware of the fact that people were being ripped off. Maybe he was standing back saying, well, maybe we should have taken action over these things. But whatever reason, it made an impact on Nicodemus' life. And he wanted to have a conversation with Jesus. And I would that everybody, not just in church, everybody would want to have that inquiring mind, that conversation with Jesus. Let's face it, there has nobody made a greater impact in the history of the world than Jesus Christ. Not any of the Caesars, not Napoleon, not even my favorite Churchill. Nobody has made an impact like Jesus Christ. And shouldn't that make us want to inquire about who is he really? And if he really is who he says he is, is his message worth paying attention to? Maybe Nicodemus, when he saw what was taking place in the temple and mulling things over, thought, maybe this is the Messiah. He knew the Old Testament prophecies. We're going to see that he was a ruler of the Jews. A member of the Sanhedrin. He would know the Old Testament inside out. And maybe Nicodemus was starting to think, well, you know, some of these prophecies in the Old Testament about having zeal for his father's house, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that God has promised to send? We've seen his miracles. We've heard about Cana of Galilee in a home where he turned water into wine. We've heard his message, what he's been saying around town. We know what his motivation is. His motivation, according to this carpenter from Nazareth, is to do his father's business and his father's will and to have zeal for his father's house. That his father's house should be a place of prayer, not a place of merchandise. 
And maybe Nicodemus is mulling these things over in his mind. The miracles, the message, the motivation. Is he the Messiah? And Nicodemus has this desire to go and meet. I was going to use the word confront, but I don't mean that in a confrontational sense. You know, if you really want to know something about somebody, go to that person. You know, the alternative is gossip. You know, you hear it from somebody else at second hand, third hand. Maybe true. I'm not talking about negative stuff. It may be true. But if you want to know something genuinely, go to the person and ask them. And Nicodemus wanted to do this with Jesus. And isn't it a great opening there? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus, we know for certain, was rich. He was respected. We know he was religious. We know that he was a ruler. He had authority in Jerusalem and in Judaism. Rich, respected, religious ruler. But none of these things obviously brought peace of mind. He was troubled. He was intrigued. He wanted to know more. Maybe a conversation with Jesus would bring some answers. You and I know the answer is obviously yes, they would. But so often we don't take that time to take a little time with the Lord and get the answers that we need. But Nicodemus was looking, and I love what somebody once said, because obviously he, he was rich, respected, religious, and so on. Somebody said he put his pride in his pocket for a private interview. And I think it's a great phrase. Now, maybe the person that said it was being presumptuous that he was a proud person. Maybe he was a humble, rich, respected, religious ruler. But, you know, sometimes we need to do that. I need to do that. When we come to the Lord, let's put our pride, our preconceived ideas in our pocket and just have a private interview with Jesus Christ and spend time with him. We don't know what Nicodemus really believed. We know that he was, as a, say, a man of the Pharisees and a ruler of the Jews. We know some of the things, obviously, that he believed. That phrase, man of the Pharisees, speaks volumes. The Pharisees were the religious exclusives of the day. As you know, there was Sadducees, scribes, Herodians, uh, zealots. There were all these different groupings, but the Pharisees were the exclusives. You know, they, you knew a Pharisee a mile away, like you still know a Pharisee a mile away today. All through the Gospels, I don't need to go over it in detail, Jesus talks about the Pharisees, how they love to walk down the street in their robes and have people greet them, how they love to stand in the temple and, you know, make a big show of their prayer. How when they're you put their money in the offering box to like everybody to see how much is going in. They were exclusive, extremely religious, and they were separate in a sense by their belief and practice. We saw in Acts that the Sadducees and the Pharisees argued over things like is there a resurrection, are there angels and so on. The Pharisees they had their strong belief and practice. And it was strong. As we know, they were very strict at keeping the law. Then we know from Galatians and other portions of Scripture that we're studying, the law doesn't save anybody. But the Pharisees did everything they possibly could to keep the law. The Sabbath. They kept the Sabbath. They never broke it. Jesus talks to the Pharisees about their tithing. And not only would they give of their money, Jesus refers to the fact that they tithed, which is a tenth, of their mint and their cumin. Can you imagine going out to your herb garden and saying, well, you know, 10% of the mint goes to the temple. 10% of cumin goes to 
the temple. These guys were so precise. Now, we, we can, you know, say, oh, that's so over the top. The ceremonial cleanness. If a cup was dirty, they wouldn't drink out it, you know. And, you know, they would wash their hands before every meal. Now, you might say, well, that's not just ceremonial. That's good, you know, hygiene. But, you know, they would wash their hands and then do it that way and then let them drip dry. You know, they wouldn't even take, you know, a towel to... And, and they had all these dietary laws, what they would eat, what they wouldn't eat. They would fast. They would observe the holy days and the feasts. And not only the written law of Moses, but unfortunately the oral law, law that had been passed down, that was adding all these other little things, and that was the issue that Jesus had with them. Now, I know that the Pharisees get a bad press because of the legalism, been hyper-religious, Sabbath-keeping, tithing, observing, I've never mentioned circumcision, you know, dietary laws, all that. Don't forget, Jesus was critical of their hypocrisy. But don't forget that Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It was, wasn't all negative. It was legalistic, and it didn't get them saved. But these guys were sincere. And so Nicodemus was extremely sincere. He wasn't playing games about religion when he came to Jesus. And so he's a man of the Pharisees, but we're also told he's a ruler of the Jews which meant, literally, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And that word ruler can mean a great man. It can actually mean a prince. And so he would have been elevated in society as well. Maybe that's how he got the job in the Sanhedrin. Historians tell us, quite a number of them, so it may well be accurate, that he was one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. If you take, you know, the three richest men today, Nicodemus was up there. He was rich, he was respected, he was religious, he was a ruler, he had all these things going for him. But none of them brought peace into his life. Look what it says in verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night, and I don't believe he came for fear of other people. He may, may have done. As I said last week or the week before, I think it was just quite simply, he knew at the end of the day Jesus would be alone and it would be a more convenient time. Maybe he was afraid of being seen. But each time he's mentioned in chapter 7 and chapter 19 as well, it always says Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night. He stood out. But he says, Rabbi, we know, and how often do, you know, when you're going to confront somebody, sometimes you don't want to say, you know, I know. It's far better if you get people behind you, even if there's nobody behind you. You know, we know. Now, maybe there were other people, maybe... Nicodemus was a representative coming on their behalf. But he says, we know, he's not actually committing himself personally, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. He calls Jesus a teacher. Calls him a rabbi. Calls him a teacher. Nicodemus would know that this carpenter's son from Nazareth had not been to rabbinical school. He knew he didn't have a degree from the temple. You know, he knew he hadn't been trained as a rabbi. And it's amazing that he, he calls him a teacher. And yet he knew that Jesus hadn't been through Bible college. 
there was something that stood out in Jesus' teaching. He calls him in the Greek a didaskalos. It's the same word that's used in Luke's gospel when Jesus was with the doctors of the temple. It's not a medical doctor, it's a learned doctor. So it could easily be translated doctor. He was elevating Jesus' teaching ability. Now, I don't think this was flattery. But he acknowledges who Jesus is. He says, we know, Rabbi, that you're a man sent from God. And it's an aside of anything else that we might ever talk about this evening. Isn't that what people should know about our life? That we have, as it says in the Acts of the Apostles, have been with Jesus. And if you've got a ministry or something to share that you've been sent by God, it was so obvious to Nicodemus. He says, Rabbi, he acknowledged that God was with Jesus. Now we know that Jesus was God, but Nicodemus acknowledges that God is with him. I can almost see a smile on Jesus' face, thinking, Emmanuel, God with us. This is a wonderful setting, wonderful situation. But he recognized that Jesus had a power, an anointing that the other teachers in all the synagogues didn't have. There was something special about this rabbi, this teacher, this man. And if you want to see it as a compliment with an alternative motive, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Whether you see it as flattery. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus didn't enter into a conversation about teaching or about rabbinical school. Or, Nicodemus, it's good to see you. I've heard about you. I know that you're in the Sanhedrin. You're one of the three, three richest guys in Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't enter into any conversation other than to say in verse 3. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, but how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? It's a very interesting thing here. When a Gentile converted to Judaism, they used the term that the Gentile was born again. And so this was not a strange phrase for Nicodemus. You know, it also can be translated born from above. And it doesn't take away from the fact that he says, but, you know, how can a man go back into his mother's womb and be born a second time? Because he was a Jew. He couldn't be born again like a Gentile. But he kind of knew what Jesus was going on about. This whole idea of a brand new start. In these verses, we're going to see Nicodemus and his belief. Nicodemus and his blindness. Nicodemus in verses 9 and 10 and his bewilderment, his amazement. Jesus is going to talk in verses 3 through 5 about the need for a new birth. And then he's going to explain in verses 6 to 8 what this new birth is all about. And he's going to give us two illustrations. One is the flesh and the spirit. One is the wind. And there's two different types of wind. And we'll get there, so don't be confused. Time is almost gone. And we haven't got anywhere close to verse 11. And I think if I was to really develop beyond verse 5, it would be doing an injustice to it. But Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 4, Nicodemus says, How? 
He didn't turn around and say, why? This is how. In verse 8, Jesus says, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? He didn't say, why do these things need to be? And that brings in the aspect of faith. There are many people in the world today, when they hear a verse like, you need to be born again, say, why? I'm rich. I'm a ruler. I'm religious. I'm respected. So why do you need to be born again? Jesus says you need to be born in the Spirit. Why? I'm a good person. There's nothing wrong with my life. I'm doing just fine. But Nicodemus doesn't say, why do you need to be born again? He says, how am I born again? And Jesus says, look, you're born from above. You know, that which is flesh is flesh. That's what is spirit. And we'll look at this next week. You see, Nicodemus knew when Jesus said, it's like a second birth. Well, it is a second birth. It's a brand new start. That's what it means to be a Christian. Some people don't like that term, born again. It's got connotations with it in the 21st century. But when you were born the first time, you were born without a past. You weren't brought into this world and you had all this past behind you. You had an absolutely brand new start. And we'll develop this next week, but what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is, Nicodemus, when you come to me and I'll allow the Holy Spirit to change your life, you will have a brand new start. We can think of all the evangelical expressions in the New Testament. Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. All things become new. That's what it means to be a Christian. Now, it's nothing, as we'll see, that we do. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I think the question should not be in our lips. Why do we need to do this, God? It's, Lord, how do we do it? How do we have that eternal life? So many things we could say. But perhaps that's a meditation for the coming week. A man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus for a conversation and says, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Nobody can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. As a Pharisee, he expected to see the kingdom of God because of his religious strictness, because of his position, because of the sect that he belonged to, the Pharisees. And Jesus, I believe, discerned that eternal life the kingdom of God, heaven, is what he was interested in. And Jesus is saying, you know, Nicodemus, if you really want eternal life, if you really want to live eternally in heaven, you need a change. You need a new start. You need to be born again. Because that which is flesh is flesh. But that which is spirit is spirit. We'll pick it up in verse 4 next week when Nicodemus says, How can a man be born when he's old? Time's gone. Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the situation that we see here with Nicodemus and Jesus. So many, 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 many lessons we can learn 
But Lord, perhaps the greatest one is that we need to develop on a regular basis that opportunity to sit with you and have a conversation. Not speaking only to you, but listening to you. Lord, we think of Mary and Martha. We think of Martha in the kitchen doing all these things. And Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus. And Lord, you said she has chosen the better part. And Lord, to be in your presence, to be able to pray, to be able to just sit at your feet Lord, help us to cultivate that desire. Just to let you show how much you care for us, how much you want to provide for us, how much you want to answer the questions that we have. And so, Lord, go with us and help us to meditate on these things until we meet again, because we ask it in Jesus' name and we ask it for his sake. And for his glory. Amen. God bless you.